All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. And thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Mike Yassa. I'm the director of the Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory and of UCI, UCI's uh, Brain Initiative. And I am delighted to welcome you here tonight as one of your hosts. And um, I'm just going to take a second to kind of tell you a little bit about the history of this, and then I'll introduce um, your actual host and moderator for the evening. So uh, one of the things that some of you might know is that the Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory and the Claire Trevor School of the Arts have been uh, attempting to work more closely together over the last couple of years now. Over the last year, I think we made a lot of progress, and I'll show you one glimpse of that. Um, and it's been a really, really exciting road. A lot of it I owe to this gentleman here. We'll introduce him in a second. Um, but it's, it's been really terrific to see that the community is um, desiring these kinds of interactions and is interested to hear much more about the interdisciplinary nature of what we can do together at UCI. Um, as a neuroscientist myself, I've been very excited to work with the School of the Arts. It has broadened my horizons. It has expanded uh, my vision for what I want this center to become. It's expanded also uh, the way that I think about neuroscience and how it applies to everyday life, including things like cinema and acting and so on. Um, so we are gathered here today because of um, this gentleman to my left, who I I'd like to introduce, but I feel that I will not do it justice. So I'd like to, instead of um, telling you more about Mr. Eyrig, I'd like to show you just a glimpse of what he's been able to accomplish at UCI, which I think is a terrific feat. So I'm gonna play a video um, that uh, captures the essence of uh, our first joint project together. And then I know you guys will not be able to see it. I apologize, <laughs> unless you really crank your head up. Um, but uh, yeah. this, is, this is really truly terrific. It's been uh, a terrific experience working with Dave on this, and it's been uh, really kind of a sensational achievements. Uh, it's been taken up by UCI.edu, put it up on their website. It's been covered by a lot of uh, media, and we're very, very proud of this accomplishment and, of course, of what Dave's been able to do. So, Stanislavski talks about sense memory, right? He talks about the emotional memory is right. The sense memory could be episodic memory. It's just episodic memory from your own life. And the way that Strasbourg teaches it is, you know, you're in a scene and I'm, this class is drum 135. It's called the science of acting. And it's the first ever unprecedented collaboration between the Claire Trevor School of the Arts and the Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory. The curriculum involves bringing some of the world's most renowned experts in different components of human behavior Behavior, such as learning and memory, emotion, or language, so that the acting students can learn more about the mechanisms of behavior from a scientific perspective. And then the next class, we'll talk about and explore ways to put those new ideas into the application of the craft. So I'm literally taking myself out of the scene to create this emotional scenario in my head, right, and hopefully recall it in some way. Then I feel the emotion and then I go back into the scene. The course challenges the students past perceptions about what acting is. So understanding how these things work and understanding that it's actually quite natural for your brain to do this on its own makes acting actually a very natural thing to do. The partnership that we are starting with the School of Arts is very, very exciting because for the first time um, we're able to take findings from the field of neuroscience and apply them directly to how acting is done. And I think that studying acting also can tremendously benefit neuroscience. So tell me what it is you really want to know. Just say it. The science of acting gives you a new perspective on a way to approach your craft, so it's been really helpful as an actor. This is definitely a turning point in learning how to become a better actor. You get to learn directly from the neuroscientists about their findings, and then you get to apply it in the workshop in real time without any delay. The way people feel in response to a situation depends on how they interpret that situation relative to their goals and things that they value. And we are hoping to really build much more dialogue between artists and scientists, especially in the context of the neuroscience of the performing arts, of dance, of music. The class is really just the beginning. This class is a venture in which we are collaborating with other schools to create real innovation in the School of the Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. David Eyrig. Uh, boy, he makes me sound uh, like I did it myself. And honestly, it's really been a true collaboration. I couldn't have brought this class together without a couple of things. But the first thing I want to say is 
we're here tonight to learn about story. And what brought us here is, well, the beginning of this story, right? But our story didn't start, our story started after this class, this collaboration, because basically what we did was we, um, we made, I, I'm willing to argue this and I, I think I'll win, I believe the result of this class was that we came up with three of the most significant advancements in actors training in the last hundred years. We made so many fun discoveries and one of them, you're gonna to learn tonight and we're gonna share it tonight. And that's the whole purpose of this evening's event is to take one technique and we're gonna work on later on. We're gonna teach you how to create a memory and store that memory so that it can affect your uh, character's behavior in the future. And we're gonna say, it worked with actors, will it work with writers? And we're gonna try it here tonight. So this could never have happened, right, without a preceding event. The preceding event was this class but that story didn't start there either because the beginning of the story actually happened, I'm going to now speculate, in a conversation between two people where they said, hey, what happens in the brain of an actor? I wonder. And if those two people hadn't have said, I would like to sponsor uh, this collaboration and talk to the deans of the school of the, uh, uh, here at the Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory, and of course the uh, dean of the uh, uh, Claire Trevor School of the Arts, we wouldn't be here. So I would like the first time ever publicly thank Diane and Dennis Baker for funding this Science of Acting class because it really, thank you so much, has snowballed into so many great discoveries and we're gonna have some more fun here tonight. Having said that, uh, the kind of exciting thing about tonight is I don't know whether it'll work or not. I, I don't know, we have never done it before. But what I do know is I have brought together some speakers that I'm still flabbergasted said yes. I'm so thrilled that I have the two, the three people that are here tonight. No, I don't count. You know, okay, then two. I knew he'd say yes, but the other two, I just really am honored that they came to, to share with us tonight. So let's get started on our story tonight. And the first thing I'd like you guys to do is with your eyes open or closed, to answer the following question for yourself. What is the one thing that you could learn here this evening that would make this the most valuable two hours of your life today? <laughs> what is the one thing that you could learn here today, recognize, identify, that would make this the most valuable presentation you've ever attended? Does anybody need, raise your hand if you need more time? Okay, great. So what do we just do? We set a frame from within which you are now going to assimilate uh, uh, some of the information you'll hear tonight. Why did we do that is a very important question. Right now, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Aaron Liebzig is a story mogul. I just made that up. But he's a man <laughs> who has made his entire career in life by sharing stories and putting stories together. I, you know, there's so many things you could say about him. He's created algorithms and, and uh, laws that people use uh, to create their films today. Uh, he teaches in the business school at Berkeley. He's an executive produ producer of the largest grossing film in the his uh, largest grossing documentary in the history of the world. That's correct, right? March of the Penguins. Second. Okay, okay. He's got about 40 films under his belt that you all know, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Good Morning Vietnam. So this is a man who knows story and I can't wait to hear his perspective. So please welcome up and thank for coming here today, Mr. Adam Leipzig for being here to tell his perspective on story. Are we live? Oh. <laughs> We're gonna be live. Get me live. We're gonna be live in a second. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> May I tell you a story? Yeah. Five years ago, on an August afternoon, a wood crate the size of a grand piano landed in a post-production facility in West Los Angeles with a profound thud on the ground. It took four men to carry it in. 
Inside were the hopes and dreams of a hundred filmmakers who didn't know how to tell the story that was represented inside that box. It had begun five years before when a BBC natural history producer named Joe Ruxton was out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean looking for what was recalled the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which I'm sure you all have heard about. Some of you think you have seen pictures of it. It's that floating island twice the size of Texas in the middle of the Pacific. Joe thought she had seen it because the news media had reported on it. So she had a story in her head, but in fact when she got there, she found that there was just clear open ocean. It's a myth. But then the scientists on the ship dragged a manta trawl behind the ship. A manta trawl is like a giant colander. It traps little particles. And what they found was much worse than a giant floating ocean, a fu giant, giant floating island. What they found was microplastic because plastic degrades. And in the center of the Pacific Ocean, they found twice as much plastic as plankton. You know how small plankton is. This is, by the way, the moment that we say we're really had the, glad that UCI has a very good recycling policy. So it's OK. Um, <laughs> they tried to cut together a version of whatever they had. And they cut together a four-hour film that had no characters in it. That was just shots of one place after another around the world. And it did not work. And that's when I got the call, uh, because I used to be the president of the National Geographic Films, during which I did do March of the Penguins and other documentaries. Um, and I got a call saying, uh, can you help us? So that thud in the post-production facility in West Los Angeles, we pried open the top of the box. And inside were 100 hard drives containing about 500 hours of footage with no cables. <laughs> the next month was spent finding cables <laughs> to see what we could pull off of those hard drives. And over the next 14 months after looking at everything, we found a story by putting people in it and turning it into a human story about a man who was an ocean man whose spirit animal was whales looking for whales and a woman who was the first woman who broke a men's sporting record who was a free diver who dives below the crushing depth of World War II submarines and loves the ocean as she loves life. And their quest to go around the world, we shot more footage, we put it all together. And because I be, it, this is really a very interesting movie in my, uh, in, in, in my panoply of films because unlike every other movie that I've made which has a decay curve where the movie opens and then it falls right off the cliff, uh, this movie which opened two years ago is still getting as many views as it did on the first day it opened. I think because we found a human emotional story with which to frame a really interesting worldwide problem and we reveal things uh, that people didn't know as the characters discover them. So with that, may I turn it back over to you, David? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to say, by the way, that uh, we had talked about telling stories that make a change in the world. Um, and that, after I saw My Plastic Ocean, um, I now no longer use plastic bags at the, at the grocery store. It was something I thought was ridiculous before. And then after I was, totally changed my behavior. So um, it's a great, it a great example of really changing s social behavior with a film, with a movie. Um, okay, now, to talk a little bit more about story this evening, and now to bring in the neuroscientific angle of story. And by the way, Adam, of course, will be coming back to help us in the second hour as our official executive producer of, you guys all know we're here to create a, the first ever neuroscientifically designed one-act play, right? You, this is the largest writing team ever assembled, I believe, and that's what we're going to do in the second hour. So in order for you to understand the principles by which uh, we are to create this story today as a team, everybody in this room, I'm going to introduce our next guest who's written two books about telling stories. Um, 
One, the first is the one I read, Wired for Story, and I read it and I loved it, and I was like, this woman's great. And then I read her second book, Story Genius. And it is genius. It is the practical application now of how to use neuroscience to tell a story that will be impactful. So without further ado, this is the great Lisa Crone, who is now going to talk to you and pay attention because there actually will be a test <laughs> in the second hour. And we're going to create a story based on what she shares with us today. So please welcome Lisa Crone. <laughs> Hi, I but this won't fall. I cannot tell you how happy I am to be here tonight because there is nothing that I love more than being in a room full of storytellers and writers. Because writers, you guys, you are the most powerful people on the planet. Why? Because story is the most potent communication tool in the world. We're wired for story. We make sense of everything through story. Story is actually built into the architecture of our brains. Every story is a call to action, which is what gives you such tremendous power. You have the power to change how your reader or your viewer sees the world, how they see themselves, what they go out and do in the world, simply by allowing them to experience life through your protagonist's subjective reality as she deals with that tough story problem that you're going to toss at her or more likely that she inadvertently brought on herself. <laughs> that is a tremendous amount of power. But as always, there's a catch. And the catch is that you have to have actually told a story. And that's my topic. My topic is story itself and what a story is and what goes into a story. And you might be thinking, Okay, but wait a minute. Didn't you just say we're wired for story? Didn't you just say it's built into the architecture of the brain? So why do we need to talk about story? Don't we just automatically know that? And the answer is no. There is a bit of fine print. And the fine print is we're wired for story because as humans, we make sense of everything in our lives through narrative. And as humans, we understand and respond to story automatically. That is part of our standard operating equipment. No one in your life ever had to teach you how to enjoy a story, right? When you're three years old, you hear a story, you get it. And from then on, you've been enthralled by stories. But there is a difference between what we come in with, those preset buttons of understanding stories, and the ability to create the kind of story that is going to enthrall other people. That is learned behavior. And I think that disconnect between our love for story, but how difficult it can be to create a story, is what led the great Southern writer Flannery O'Connor to once quip. She said, I find most people know what a story is until they sit down to write one. <laughs> and I can't tell you how true I found that. I've worked with story and writers with manuscripts and, and screenplays frankly, for more decades than I want to admit to being alive. And in that time, I can't tell you how many, let's say, screenplays I've read. Or if you asked me, what's it about? I'd say, it's about 110 pages. I have no idea. It's just a bunch of things that happen. So the question is, how do you avoid that? How do you write something that actually is a story and isn't just a bunch of things that happen? So. What I want to do is talk about story. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to tell you what a story is. I'm going to say it twice. I'll try to say it slowly because I know I talk really fast. And then we're going to break it down in familiar writing parlance. So what is a story? Here's what a story is. A story is about how what happens affects someone who's in pursuit of a deceptively difficult goal and how that person changes internally as a result, let me say that again. A story is about how what happens affects someone who's in pursuit of a deceptively difficult goal and how that person changes internally as a result. Now let's break that down. The story is about how what happens. That how what happens is merely, and I'm using the word merely, is merely the surface 
of the story. It is not, and I cannot say it strongly enough, it's not what the story is about. In fact, it's not even what you develop first, that comes second. So to be very clear, yes, that surface of the story is the plot. And if I leave you with nothing else, it's this. The story is not about the plot. The plot comes second. That's why if it was up to me, and I know this is a very incendiary thing to say, both literally and figuratively, but if it was up to me, I would burn every story structure book from the hero's journey on up to now, <laughs> because for one thing, sorry about that, <laughs> for one thing, it's a misnomer. It's not story structure, it's plot structure. And the story is not about the plot. In fact, if you just have a plot, birth, death, fall, the Roman Empire, it is going to be flat and dull because stories about what happens, that's the plot, how it affects someone. That someone is your protagonist. Your protagonist is your reader or viewer's avatar within the story. Just think of story as it's like a Vulcan mind meld between the protagonist and the audience. They've done functional MRI studies that show when you're lost in a story, the same areas of your brain light up that would light up if you were doing what that main character is doing. You really, really are there. And so to make the point, everything that happens over here in the plot, even if it is birth, death, fall, the Roman Empire, is going to get its meaning and therefore its emotional weight because meaning is what triggers emotion. So everything that happens in the plot is going to get its meaning and emotional weight based on one thing and one thing only. And that is how it is affecting your protagonist. But not affecting your protagonist in general, affecting your protagonist in pursuit of a difficult goal, deceptively difficult. It doesn't seem so hard in the beginning as it gets toward the end. Now that difficult goal is what's sometimes called a story problem or the plot problem, because as we know, stories are about how you solve a problem that you cannot avoid. That's what stories are there for. They help us deal with the thing that from time immemorial has scared us more than anything, which is the unknown and the unexpected. So that story problem is something that we cannot walk away from. We have to deal with it. So stories about how what happens, that's the plot, affect someone, that's your protagonist, in pursuit of a deceptively difficult goal, that is that story problem, and how that person changes internally as a result. And that, my friends, is what the story is actually about. In other words, the story is not about the plot. The story is about how the plot affects the protagonist. The story is not about an external change. Story is about an internal change inside your protagonist. And if you're thinking, wait a minute, what do you mean story is about an internal change in my protagonist? Why should my protagonist need to change? Change from what to what? They just walked onto the page. Why would they need to change? Aha. All protagonists, all characters actually enter the story with two things already fully formed. The first is something they want and have long wanted. And the second thing is a misbelief, as we'll discuss in depth, a misbelief about human nature that probably came into their lives and took root during childhood. That is what creates a story. That is what you need to figure out first because, and this is the point, all stories begin en medias res. En medias res is a really fancy Latin way of saying in the middle of the thing. The thing being the entire story from the inception of the misbelief all the way to the end, which means that the first page of your novel or your screenplay or your play is actually the first page of the second half of your story. If you don't have the first half, then the second half of what? I mean, think about it just for a second, that problem that your protagonist is gonna face that they cannot avoid that's gonna start right there on page one. Think about in your own life when big problems happen. Sometimes we'll go, oh my gosh, that problem just came out of the blue. Well, let's be honest. <laughs> big problems never come out of the blue. They took a long time to build and to get to that place where they become critical mass. And now we absolutely have to deal with it. And what we come for in story, we don't come for what your protagonist or any of your characters do. We don't come for the action. We don't come for the what. We come for the why. And the why always comes from the past. And the reason I'm hitting on this really hard 
is because what I'm talking about is something that is often frowned upon in the writing world. In fact, the writing world tends to look down on it. Because yes, for you writers out there, I'm talking about backstory. Backstory is something that is often reviled in the writing world. Be careful of backstory, anything that happened before the story started. Use it sparingly and only when the reader or the audience needs to know could not be more wrong. Backstory is the most fundamental layer to where all story logic comes from. It is the most fundamental layer of the story that you're writing. It's where meaning comes from. That's why without it, and this is what's wrong with those story structure models, you're just going to write a bunch of things that happen. Same thing is true of, and for those of you who are not writers, I'm going to say same thing is true of pantsers. And people will sometimes go, what's a pantser? A pantser is somebody who writes by the seat of their pants. They go, I'm just going to start writing. I'm going to start on page one. I'll write forward. The problem with both the story structure, plot structure, which is you start at page one and you go forward, is that you're just going to end up with a bunch of things that happen. It's like saying, I'm going to write a story about the most important and significant and hard-earned turning point in someone's life who I know absolutely positively nothing about. It doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? Because that person, just like you, gets meaning from the same place. Because what I'm talking about right now isn't a writing rule. In fact, it doesn't have anything to do with writers or writing rules or what you're told to do in a writing class. It has to do with us as humans and the way that we make sense of things and the way our brains work. Because for each of us, all of us in this room, we, when we think about what we like, the meaning we read into things, the things that we want, the things that we're afraid of, all of that. Do you know where all of the meaning comes from? Everything that we look at? Do you know where it comes from, where we get meaning from? It comes from one place and one place only. And that is what our past experience has taught us those things mean. I was reading a book recently that said neuroscientists believe that the core mechanism of the brain is a time machine whose goal is to record past memories in order to predict the future. In other words, in order to let us to survive. I mean, without that, if we couldn't look at past memories in order to predict the future, we'd all cross the street and get run over in about two minutes mm. because we wouldn't know that a car was going to come and hit us. This is how the brain works. This is what you need to know. Or, to put it a bit more poetically, as Faulkner said, the past isn't dead. It isn't even past. It is right here. So, when you've got your characters and they're entering the two things they need, one, Every character, not just the protagonist, but every character enters the story long before they have any idea of the dark and stormy night that you have in store for them with two things. First is something they want and something they wanted for a long time, something specific. And the reason you need to know that is because what they want sets their agenda. And characters, again, before they know about that dark and stormy night, step onto page one with a story-specific agenda and scene by scene, by scene, by scene, they are trying to move that particular agenda forward, as is every character. But, you know, if you've got a character and they know what they want, and they've got an agenda for getting it, they're going to step onto page one and they might, like, you know, get what they want before you're halfway through the scene. And that's, that's great for them in real life. It kind of sucks for us out here in the story, because now the story's over. So that brings us to the second thing that we need, and that is a misbelief. And we talked a minute ago about stories about an internal change. This is what your story is actually about, is overcoming this misbelief. And when we're talking about a misbelief, it is a misbelief about human nature, a misbelief about what makes us tick, a misbelief about what we need to do out there in the world of other people to keep ourselves safe and at the same time get what we need. A misbelief is never something that is factual or logistic. It's not something like, my entire life, I thought the world was flat and I'm glad you're all sitting down because it's round. Who would have known? Or I thought she was my sister and she's really my mom? Wow, someone's got some explaining to do. Now, those things could be true, but that's not what a misbelief is. A misbelief is something along the lines of, I learned early on 
that if you show emotion, well, people are going to know what you care about. They could use it against you, and you're going to look weak. Emotion makes you look weak, and I want to be strong. So a strong person never shows emotion. In fact, I'm not even going to feel any emotion because they don't have to worry that it'll like, you know, leak out and, and get in the way. That's a misbelief. Or something like, and the one I always tend to use is, the nicer someone is to you, the more they really want to get to know the real you, the more what they're really trying to do is to use and manipulate you. That is an example of a misbelief. And they always come in in childhood because in childhood we are trying to figure out how things work and what we need to do to survive. It's like you may have heard of that Maslow's you know, triangle of needs, right? Pyramid of needs, Abraham Maslow. And he says, you know, the top one is whatever it is you need to live a happy, full, you know, fulfilled life. At the bottom of the pyramid, he says, here's the first thing that we need as humans. We need food, we need water, we need shelter. And that's certainly true. But it is not the first thing that we need. Because when you're a baby or a child, good luck to you. The first thing we need is someone who cares about us enough to give us those things. And we are trying to get the experience to figure out how the world works. So to take that example of the nicer someone is to you, the more they're trying to use you, here's an example that as adults, I'm thinking we've probably all had in one way or another. And that is you meet someone and, you know, not talking about a romantic relationship here, but you meet someone and you've got simpatico and you feel that sense of, you know, camaraderie where you think this person could be a lifelong friend. This is really something. And then they ask you to invest your life savings in a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> and at that point, you go, okay, that person is a jerk. I am pushing that person out of my life. Everybody else, there's all sorts of great people, but that guy's a jerk. Now, if something like that happens to you when you're a child, you know, not that anybody would try to have you invest in a Ponzi scheme as a kid, unless you're Donald Trump at eight years old and you're already a millionaire. <laughs> and the rest of us, that probably didn't happen. But something like that to happen when you're a child, you don't think, okay, that's how that person is. You think, that's how people are. That's everybody. Got it. In other words, what was adaptive in a normal childhood trauma, when I say childhood trauma, I don't mean like with a capital T, like, you know, you get sucked into a spaceship or, you know, thrown into a white van and taken into the desert or something, but just a normal childhood trauma. You go, okay, in that situation, I got it. And that's adaptive because you've had that aha moment and now you are going to avoid that person. But that belief, the more someone really wants to get to know you, the more they're trying to abuse you, well, out there in the real world, that's maladaptive. That's not true at all. And the reason I like to use the term, the term misbelief is because it is on one level neutral. In other words, in, in the writing world, they'll talk about characters come in and they've got a fatal flaw and they've got to overcome the flaw. And I don't like that terminology mm -hmm. at all because it's, it sounds very judgmental, doesn't it? It sounds finger waggy, like you have a flaw. There's something wrong with you. Like you're almost like morally bankrupt. You're doing it on purpose. A misbelief is something very different. A misbelief, your character has a misbelief. They're not stupid. They're not bad. They're not immoral. Life taught them something and they feel very lucky to have to have learned that early on. They feel like this is something that now is gonna help them, a savvy piece of inside intel that's gonna help them live their lives better. I'm not saying they think about it consciously, but that's how they pull that forward. So then the story is imagining now that what that character wants is, is, is somebody to really, you know, they can open up to and who will like them for who they are. But of course, anybody who really wants to get to know them is only trying to use them, you can see that that misbelief has kept them from getting what they want. And now that misbelief and that desire ricochet through that character's life in a story-specific way. So, <laughs> so I know, as you would say, David, so they're making the memories they've got is story-specific to, it now lands <clears throat> them up on page one. Chances are by developing the story to begin with, the plot starts to auto-populate. And that's what's brought them to that point. And then the goal of the plot, plot being one single problem that grows, escalates, and complicates from the beginning all the way to the end. And the goal of the plot is to force your protagonist to go after that thing they've always wanted. But in order to get it, 
they're going to have to overcome and see that misbelief, which is at that point has been so deeply absorbed and personified in their life that they're not thinking it, but that's what's holding them back. And scene by scene by scene by scene, they go forward trying to get what they want, but bucking the misbelief along the way. And those two things together, the misbelief and that desire, are what I call your story's third rail. That's where all the electricity comes. That's where all the meaning comes from. The meaning of what happens up here, this is just a what, gets its meaning by the internal struggle that it forces your character to have scene by scene by scene by scene. So that that misbelief that has now been, not to go more deeply into the brain science, but is now in their cognitive unconscious. It's just the way they see things. The plot, the goal of the plot is to make the unconscious conscious. And now it's coming up and they start to be able to see it for the thing that it is. What's holding them back? And at the end, toward the end, they have that aha moment where they make that change, where they see that misbelief for what it is, wrong. That's what we come to story for. We don't come to story for the surface. People will often think, well, the surface, what's your narrative through line? <clears throat> narrative through line is the plot, could not be less true. Narrative through line is this internal struggle. Think of it this way. Narrative through line is the story that your protagonist is telling themselves as they go forward, making sense of what's happening and meaning out of it. And that's what then spurs the action to take, just like all of us in our lives, that's what we do. We don't come to story for the surface, is the point. We have the surface covered. We live in the surface world. All of you and me, we all live in the surface world. And I think all of us have done a bang up job of it because from mm -hmm. birth until now, here we are. And I've been watching all of you surreptitiously as I've been speaking. And I think I can say with some authority that not one of you needs to watch a movie or read a novel that's gonna help you sit better in the surface world. You guys got that covered. But that's not what we wanna know. We wanna know what goes on beneath the surface. I often think of story as a difference between what we say out loud and what we're really thinking when we say it. Because ask yourselves, how often is what you're saying and what you're thinking the same thing? And which one is more interesting? And which one is more revealing? And which one is juicier? What you're thinking. And isn't that what you want to know from everybody else? Even the barista at Starbucks, you want everybody to like us? Are you thinking, did that land well? I, I ordered that foofy drink. Do you think that I'm just worthless? Or, I mean, that's what we want to know. If someone comes up to you and says, Matilda, I'll love you forever. What's your first thought after? My name's not Matilda. It's Really? Can I trust you? Are you punking me? Are you just looking to get lucky? What? This is what we want to know. We've all heard that quote, and I'm sure you've raised your hand if you've heard the expression, never let him see a sweat. Did you ever hear that expression? Yeah. And what does it imply? It implies that on the surface, we're trying to pretend everything is fine. And beneath the surface, we're sweating buckets. Stories about the sweating. I once had a student at UCLA who said, she said, I know on the surface, I look really put together. And she did, she really did. She said, but inside, I'm a raging mess. And I'm trying to keep all of you from seeing it. Story's about the raging mess. It's about being vulnerable. It's about the things we're too afraid to say out loud. That's what we come to story for, that openness, for those me too moments of, oh my God, me too, I feel that too. Oh my God, I thought I was the only one. Oh my God. I thought that that made me weird, and now I realize it makes me special. That's the power of story. That's the power that you have. And that's it. Wow. <laughs> For now. That's it. For so Lisa has given us some insight into the way a story can be put Bravo. together and Shepard. some places Thank that you. we can Thank place you. our focus as we're creating our story here tonight as a team. But I would like now to turn over to uh, my good friend, Dr. Michael Yasso, the director of the Center for Neurobiology of Learning and Memory in which we sit, um, one of the most uh, successful uh, centers in the world, I believe. And I'm gonna turn it over to him because what I'd like you to do, sir, is whatever you do, but hopefully, <laughs> Hopefully, you will make sense of how what she talked about is reflected in the function of our brain. Yeah, yeah. What, what she said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Lisa, that was incredible. Thank you. It was so yeah. it, really, yeah. really yeah. informative. As a nurse, I have to give it to you one more time. I mean, it was just, you know, and I told Lisa this earlier because we were on conference call yesterday and we were chatting a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. And I, and I realized at the end of our conversation that you knew more about neuroscience than most neuroscientists do. Um, they may not claim that. They may, they may you know. Uh, but but this, is, this is really quite spectacular because I think it bridges the two worlds together. So the question running in my mind, of course, is what could I possibly contribute to this discussion? Um, since you've already heard quite a bit about how our brains are wired for story from Lisa. But there's a few threads maybe I can, can pull apart and expound on a little bit. Um, the first one is that my story is a little bit more about survival, which is one of the themes that you heard about from Lisa also. And, and there's a, this is a, a theme that's worth stressing a couple of times. I think it's very, very important. So why survival? What are we talking about here? And the idea is story and narrative are really deeply ingrained in the brain from a fundamental perspective at a fundamental level because that is based on our survival instinct. So the idea here is that in order for us to be able to thrive in the environment, in order for us to be able to make decisions that promote our survival, that are not damaging to our survival, we have to be able to retain some record of our experience to be able to make decisions in the future. Now that narrative requires that we're able to sequence events, are able to think of A as leading to B, leading to C, build causative loops, be able to understand causation, be able to understand how one event might lead to another, so that we avoid doing stupid stuff in the future if it's caused us harm in the past. And we can make right decisions that promote our survival in the future. So, so that makes narrative an essential part of our brain processing. In fact, if you look at the architecture in the brain that is, that is for uh, building memories and, and storing memories in the brain, everything is in terms of sequences. So we see sequential activation, uh, sequential firing of cells, as an animal, for example, traverses a, just a simple maze and you stick electrodes in their brain, record from brain cells, as they're having this experience, you see a sequence of cells fire. Mm -hmm. And that sequence is very reliable. So the next time I put the animal in the same environment, that same sequence goes off. And it tells us something about how the brain has a mental representation of that experience, that environment. It is highly reliable. It fires exactly the same way every time, which means it recognizes what this environment is. Every time you're placed in that same environment, you are able to retrieve it. You bring back that narrative, that sequence, that memory, that story. Which leads us to another really interesting part of this. It's also about survival, which is that we tend to think of our memories as, as quite veridical records of, of the past. And in fact, they're not. In fact, far from it. They're incredibly reconstructive. Most of them are false. In fact, it turns out that as we get older, we generate more false memories, but with higher confidence. So, very highly confident false memories. So, so, as you get up there in age, when you start to think about writing your autobiography, you know, lies, lies, damn lies. But this happens simply for one reason, which is that every time you retrieve an experience, you retrieve a memory, your brain is capable of changing it. Ever so slightly. Every time you bring back that story, it changes ever so slightly. So there's a story that I used to tell at family gatherings, and I used to tell it quite frequently. And then finally, my brother was there. He heard me say this story, and he said, you know, that's all fine and good. And I remember something very similar to that, but that, wasn't, that happened to me. That didn't happen to you. <laughs> and I don't believe him, but we still have no idea who it actually happened to. But, but it morphed over time, and it turns out that, you know, it could have happened to either of us. And of course, that story could have been told to me by somebody else, or maybe he told me the story, and I just incorporated it into my narrative, because it was plausible. It made sense. It had causal elements. It has a past and present and future. It had A to B to C. And that's the reality of how we store narrative. If it's plausible, if it makes sense, if it could have been part of our history, if it's something that could have been in our past, it's easy for us to incorporate it, relate to it, and make it our own. And the brain gets to a point where it really can't dissociate between those two. So Beth Loftus, who's one of our fantastic, phenomenal faculty here who's done a lot of work on false memory. Uh, many years ago, collaborated with another colleague of mine, Craig Stark, also here at UCI. They did a functional MRI study to look at can you dissociate in the brain based on functional MRI between false memories and true memories. And it turns out that for most of this, you can't. It's very, very few parts of the brain that can actually tell the difference between false memories and true memories. And they're usually in visual cortex, auditory cortex, so early sensory areas, the places that would have really experienced this experience, but the person can't report on it. So if you ask the person, is this something that truly happened or not? 
they're going to be a chance. They're just guessing. They have no idea. And she's made a, a career out of essentially implanting false memories into people's minds. <laughs> it's incredible. But she does this because she is, is attempting to make a very, very important lesson abundantly clear to everyone. Memory is reconstructive, right? It is not a 100% a, a accurate track record of the past. It's not a video camera. It's not a photograph. It does not have any real uh, validity to it. Once that memory has been, has been encoded, every time that you bring back that memory, it changes ever so slightly. So that means we have a, a, a really important device on our hands here which is that the way that our brains store memory allows us to be able to build narratives that are very plausible, that can fit within characters, and I go back to the backstory. And this is one of the reasons why the backstory is so important. If you don't understand the why, the motivations, why characters are where they are in life, what events might have led to that, and if those events are implausible, if they're ones that you can't relate to, then it's not a real story. But the reason why stories become very attractive, the reason why they can engage people's brains in fMRI scans, so some of the studies that Lisa talked about, there's a few other studies I mentioned there yesterday that were done to look at how brain activity across different people can, can go off in the same way if they're watching something really, really engaging or immersed in the same story. So what we find is that when the story is very immersive, brain activity across two individuals watching it looks very much the same. But if it's not as immersive, it looks different which means they're interpreting things differently. But, but the capacity of a story to be captivating, to really sync up brain activity across individuals, to captivate their, their attention and their imagination, is something to do with the story itself. The fact that it has some plausibility to it, some relatable elements, something that is immersive, something that allows you to build that trajectory, that backstory, to understand the character's motivation up until this point in time that you're visiting with them for the first time. So, this, again, it, it makes the idea of story and narrative a very natural thing for the brain to do, a very natural thing for the brain to, to strive to accomplish, to like, to enjoy. We gravitate towards story. Whenever something leads to something else, that's a, a very plausible piece of, I'm not going to use the word plot, narrative. <laughs> and, and that narrative construction is what our brain does all the time, 100% of the time that it is awake. And when we sleep, we replay it. So basically all the time. Because at any point in time, we want to be, and you're doing it right now, so your brains are actually replaying things that I said 10 seconds ago, and the things that Lisa said a little while ago, the things that Adam said a while ago, and Dave said a while ago, all of that is constantly replayed in your brain, and you're constantly trying to make sense of the environment that you're in. Now, the root of this, again, is survival. We go back to, this is based on survival instinct. In fact, this is what, something that Lisa mentioned to me earlier, but I'll mention it again. We're, our brains are wired not for today's world. Right? It's for a past world that we're not living in anymore. But right now, our ability to encode narrative and use it in this constructive way to actually make entertainment out of it is a side effect. It is, it is a, it's a side outcome of a brain that is simply wired for survival. And that's my story. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Mm. You're sticking to it. All right, I'm sticking to it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Time. So I think what I'll do is I'll just give you just something to mull over and we'll take a little break. How long do we usually break? In a, something like 10 minutes? 10 minutes? 10 minutes? Okay, great. So I'm going to give you something to mull over on the break, and that is uh, when we come back, we're going to create a story as a team. Um, what we're doing that's a little different that I don't think has ever been done before is directly a result of me looking at Lisa's book and noticing that in order for her to teach somebody how to tell a story, she spent half of her book on backstory. Mm -hmm. And that correlated perfectly with what I learned when I was teaching actors, implementing some of these ideas in the science of acting class, which was if I really wanted a, an actor to embody the behaviors of a character, that the easiest thing for us to do was to spend a lot of time on their backstory, which for an actor is the actual embodiment of a memory. So we literally then conferred with some of the uh, scientists here and said, well, how do we create memories? And then we reverse engineered it, and that's the technique that we teach actors, and it worked like that. And so what we've got, I believe now, we're gonna experiment with it, a more efficient way to possibly come up with a story that will be I hope, pretty good, right? Doesn't have to be great, but we're gonna give it a shot. 
And the thing that we're going to try that I think that hasn't been done before is we're going to use the collective consciousness of 100 people to go ahead and live the backstory. We're going to create memories and then based on whatever our story is about. So all we need to start our story is going to be, I'm going to use Lisa's term, a story point. So while you're out taking a break, don't take a break. I want you to think. <laughs> I want you to come up with what you want, might enjoy telling a story about. What, what point might you want to make? Think of it as a point about human nature. What point do you want to make that's true about human nature that people get wrong sometimes? Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of something that would be a good story point? I mean, all, it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. You know, anything, it'll sound like a bumper sticker, and that is fine. Yeah. It's exactly. just something Make bumper stickers. really, yeah, yeah really you. simple, you know. Yeah. And every story has one, and interestingly enough, now I use the word theme yeah. because people understand it, especially actors, but if you Google any story, you can look up the theme, right? And we can, re, we can make that sound like a story point, but you'll see every story is centered around one idea and i yes. like this idea and it makes story. one point that's why theme is so general and vague and conceptual i like to just get rid of it entirely and think but what's the point because that's what you ask everybody when people are like nattering at you and they're telling you you never go wait 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 what's your theme you say wait 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 what's your point <laughs> what are you trying to say it concretizes it so that you know what you're writing about theme Sorry. is too much in the ether in my opinion I love it. Okay, so we'll take a 10 minute break. You'll come back with some story points. We'll vote on which one we want to enact. And uh, we'll have uh, the great uh, executive producer of the first ever neuroscientifically designed one act play written by the largest writing team in history. <laughs> Commence in 10 minutes. All right. So I had, to, I had to stop these guys because they're having a very interesting conversation with Iris. And they're, all that yeah, smartness yeah, yeah. is contained. Far, far more interesting than anything you have to say right now, actually. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I'll ask it back to For sure. <laughs> oh, we did. Um, <laughs> okay, so here you go. This is the experimental part of the evening. And um, we're just going to, a lot of this is going to be by the seat of our pants. But the theory is that by using a new technique that was found in this collaboration to design memory and encode information to uh, allow our brains to take a certain um, uh, position in choosing outcomes. Well, that was very ambiguous, but it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll all come clear in the, in the doing. Uh, we're gonna see if we can't um, come up with a story um, that works, okay? And by the way, in case you don't know, this is the first part of the series. The second, whatever we come up with tonight, we're going to come up with the spine of a story. Um, the, um, the proposal that's on the table now is to teach another class, which will be to study language or dialogue through the lens of cognitive linguistics. And this is an idea that was spurred on from the science of acting class when um, Dr. Greg Hickok talked about language and how it's a brain function in and of itself. And so we started thinking about dialogue through that lens and uh, one of my students came up with their final project based on just that single idea, and my wheels have been spinning. So the idea is we're going to come up with a series of events that will um, uh, affect the character's life, and then the proposal is that this next class, the students will actually create the dialogue using principles from the cognitive linguistic sciences. That's the plan. So let's give them something to work with. All right, so let us hear a couple of story points. What would we like, what points would we like to make to the world tonight? Raise your hand and I'll just go ahead and pick people up. Uh, you have a little good one, Mr. Tail. No, is the American dream true? <laughs> okay, is the American dream true? So, we'll, so we have to make a statement, the American dream is true. The story will determine whether or not it is or is not. Uh, give me another story point, yes sir. Uh, education is a journey, not a destination. Education is a journey, not a destination. Like a That's a good bumper sticker. Yes, sir. Nice. Yes. Uh, people only look out for themselves. People only look out for themselves. Good. Sir? 
parents know what's best for their child. <laughs> uh, parents always know what's best for their child. This is appropriate for this yes. audience. Cheaters never prosper. Cheaters never prosper. Ah. Well, Cheaters never prosper. <laughs> if you don't say yes, it won't be memorable. If you don't say yes, it won't be memorable. Right. That's gonna well, let's get, let's get out of a second. Let's get out of a second. <laughs> Everyone has a soulmate. Everyone has a soulmate. Oh, okay. This, I, his, I, his room is amazing at bumper stickers. Hang on. <laughs> okay. We got to give Adam a second to catch up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, right. Don't say yes. If you don't say yes, it won't be memorable. I do believe that's true. <laughs> I would. I, I think we have plenty. So we'll take one more because I was going oh, to. No, we did sure. conclude that Adam does have the best handwriting in all of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's Sorry. get a round of applause for Adam's right. handwriting. <laughs> do we have enough? That's a compliment. I think we have plenty. Do we have enough? I think we have plenty. Adam, that's a compliment to your writing skill. Thank you. <laughs> now, one of the things that Lisa claims, which I find is amazing, is that starting with this idea that we will auto-populate, I love that word, I really have never heard it before, auto-populate the story of events. So that's going to be something that's pretty interesting to find if it's true. Which one of these ideas do we like? And Adam, I'll let you choose it as executive producer in any way you like. Okay, I'm going to do this. Uh, we're going to do this in two rounds of audience acclamation. Pick one that you're going to applaud for. Find the one you're going to, going to applaud for. And I'm going to start down here at the bottom. Everyone has a soulmate? Okay, I'm going to read them one. Yes, because the handwriting. <laughs> Is the American dream real? Education is a journey, not a destination. People look out for themselves. Parents know what is best for their children. Cheaters never prosper. If you don't say yes, it won't be memorable. And everyone has a soulmate. Pick only one to applaud for. Okay, starting at the bottom. Everyone has a soulmate. If you don't say yes, it won't be memorable. You can only applaud for one. Cheaters never prosper. <laughs> Parents know best. <laughs> People look out for themselves. <laughs> Education is a journey, not a destination. <laughs> is the American dream real? Okay. Um, we have a winner. Yeah. The winner for sure. Yeah. People look out for themselves yeah. seems to be the winner. Okay, that's where we are. That, what, right. What's next? What's next? The so the next thing that we're going to do now that we've decided what our, the point of our story is, is we're going to ask ourselves, what would you have to believe in order to believe that, what would have to happen to you, sorry, what would have to happen to you in order for you to believe that people look out for themselves? And just take a minute to sort of brainstorm that for yourself. What event would have to happen in your past? What event would have to occur in your past, or in, a, in an imaginary world, what event would have to occur in order for your character to believe that people only look out for themselves? Are we allowed to participate? Yes. Oh. <laughs> and you just added a word. Thought you added only. Which one? People only look out for themselves. And I think she said people look out for themselves. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you say only? only, only. Look out. Okay, so only was not there. <laughs> yeah. Good. So only is there. Yeah. Only is in there. Yeah, it was there. Got it. Okay, so yes. now let's just brainstorm. And the thing is now we can actually bounce off each other and see what we like. So what would have to happen in some character's life in order for them to believe that, uh, you know, let's start in the back. Yeah. Uh, abandonment. Abandonment. Good. Give me the event. So what, what kind of a, uh, give me an event that's a bit that is it, uh, Okay, so they, somebody's parent walked out when they were young. Okay, good. Their parents walked out and were drug lords. And were what? Drug lords. Oh, yeah. <laughs> drug lords? Yes. Drug lords. Yeah. I like that detail. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we've got a Y now. <laughs> oh, a lifeboat or, after? Or something like that. It could be a space capsule after. Okay. <laughs> yes. A life capsule after a Yes, a survival resource was uh, at yeah. stake. So um, somebody uh, either got kicked out or someone's loved. So let's make an event. So what happened? Did, did they get kicked out of the lifeboat or somebody's loved one get kicked out of the lifeboat after a shipwreck? Titanic. 
Right? You, you see where you see where it goes? That's how that person can make that hit memory. And run. More. What's that? Hit and run. A hit and run occurred. So then make it specific. What event happened uh, to what person? Riding a bicycle and they got hit and the guy took off. Ooh. Okay. Hmm. Okay. You have to understand the other person's perspective until they chose themselves, because otherwise they might just not like you. If that makes sense. So put that in an event. What no, event I don't, occurred? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Take a minute to consider. Think about that. Where that came from? Should we should come back to you? What's your name? Anna. Anna. Okay, we're coming back to you. Go. Yes. Wait just again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you're like held captive inside a house, right? But then there's someone who wants to rob the house, right? So then they see you held captive, but they only have a little bit of time to rob the house before the owner comes back. And they're like, cost-benefit analysis, do I save this person <laughs> or do I, uh, yeah. I Dave, that's what you were looking for. I saw this movie last night. It's a full event, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, was that one of yours? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Do you rescue yeah. the captive? This feels Finding like a... Finding out when you were very, very young that somebody made a donation that helped you a lot, but then finding out that they really only did it for the tax write-off at the same point in time as you were binge-watching Friends on Netflix and ran into the Phoebe Buffet thing. <laughs> but that, wait, can, can I just say something about that one? I think I know I, what I, she's I, talking I just about. want to say something, except for the, I never watch Friends, so I don't know that. But, I, but, but, but that notion of somebody thought that somebody did a good thing and they felt good about it, and now they find out they did it for, that's exactly the sort of thing that would do it because they got skin Betrayal. in the game. They had one belief, oh my God, you did that for me and I feel so good. And now it's like, oh yeah, and no, I was just this tax write-off. That would that that's yeah, a perfect that event to do something like that. Okay, yeah. Good. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. And, and that. But what about thinking of the character not as somebody who's been the victim of people only caring about themselves, but as somebody who made a selfish choice mm -hmm. in his or her past and then created this belief, this false belief, in order to feel better about themselves? Oh, I absolutely well, love it. Made yeah. That bad choice, but that's what everybody does. Great. Right. What are, right. give, give us an event that supports so I, that. I you know there is an opportunity, like let's say the, the lifeboat or somebody could get rescued. I took somebody's place. I didn't offer it to someone else, but that's just that's human nature. That's life. I did what I had to do. Okay, great. So I took right. somebody's place in a lifeboat and justified that action because. Right. But still, but what you'd want though is is a reason why they were willing to justify it. They saw something before somebody did that. They realized it, so they're not just a jerk. In other words, right. I did a bad thing, I'm going to say it's okay. You want the, still the why for that, you know, the initial why, because they totally might, a lot of people believe You want to that. go further back. Right. You, you want to go, well, what you made them believe back. that that would yeah. be okay? Abandonment, maybe. And, and, yeah. and what we'll but do... But that's good. Yeah, Just, no, no. You want to go one step further back. Right. And, and what we'll do after we determine, what we're doing right now is allowing the, the, the circumstances of the story to auto-populate themselves. What we'll do next then is go ahead and create that next memory that okay. creates the action and, and, and uh, we'll create it literally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Blake. So say you were like a detective investigating a mob. You've been doing this for a very, very long time. So you witness like these mob members ratting each other out every single day of your life throughout your entire career. Right. So then you're kind of just like experiencing betrayal and people are looking out for themselves as a career. Okay, so a detective who's consistently uh, reinforced the idea by watching bad guys. Maybe. You're sitting at the kitchen table as a young child and you're listening to your parents tell an adult or have an adult conversation about some misfortune that your father had at work and your mother at that moment starts to say people only look out for themselves and that causes you to do that. Oh, great. Overheard the mother say it and accepted it as true in relation to the circumstance where Okay, can I Yes. I'm gonna call too easy on everybody. <laughs> uh, you're all making things up. Uh, I don't, I'm not buying it. I think it's way too easy. I think it's facile. I think you guys are going to places where you think stories should go and you're sort of <coughs> psychologizing about stuff. Uh, uh, I, will, I will bet that 50% of the people in this room believe that people only look out for themselves. And so I want to know where you got that. I want, I want, someone, I want to know someone who's <laughs> brave enough to share openly where you got that. Yeah, you were the first hand up. I can share a real experience. Go. Um, 
mom says, oh, we don't have money for this or that for you, but spends lavishly on herself, on her hair, her outfits, etc. Okay, I believe that. What else can we believe? Yeah. Being stood up over and over again. Pardon me? Being stood up over and over and over again. Okay. Um, mom says no money, but spends. Being stood up uh, in a romantic context? So, yeah. Well, or don't guess so. What's real? People not following through over and over. Generic. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't want to share it in the room, that's okay. But I'm really looking for real. Okay, who else? Yeah, we're, we're in law school. And a lot of programs on a, on a curve, so everyone's in competition. So you can have these relationships, you can have these friendships, even alliances, where you're trying to wrap your around material, work together, but in the end, you know, maybe one of you gets an A at the expense of the other oh. one not getting an A. Right. And so maybe there's this incentive for you to say, maybe I figured this out, and we're helping each other. Right. But this one time, I'm going to keep it to myself. Right. That's exactly the difference. Hmm. Like the Hunger Games. The Hunger Games in UCI Law School. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, no, okay. Yeah. This is, yeah. Where else? Any more? That could also apply in sports, right? Like, we play a little volleyball and so mm -hmm. So, and they're like, oh, good shot. And you're like, no, it's, you don't really think it's a good shot. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, I think that's a good one for that reason because right. everybody's got some, you could look at it and you go, oh, yeah, I've had that experience too in whatever my realm is because mm -hmm. that, that, I, right. that one really does have the ring of, and that internal conflict of, you know, it's got to cost you something to let the other person not get the good grade to realize that, oh, my God, I found this, you know, but I'm not, well, that book was out of the library. I don't know. I don't know what happened to that page. Someone... <laughs> I mean, that's got a lot of inner conflict in it as well. So, um, do, do we need more or do, or do we have? I think we should generate a couple more. Yeah. Okay. Feel, I mean, the, the really okay. interesting thing about these that's different from before, and I think that's kind of what Adam was going for, is that these are relatable. I mean, yeah. you can look at them and say, I could see how examples of right. this could play into my life. And, and the, the more real it is, I think the better the, the story is coming out. So. Well, wouldn't adoption <laughs> fall right into that category? Of so what, what particular what's facet? The what's the, what's the event, right? Um, well, I don't know. I've been okay. adopted. Are you adopted? Yeah. How does it feel? I feel great. Okay. <laughs> you don't feel great about the adopted, you know. No. How does he really feel? Airbus. Airbus. We'll hear. There's only one of his four fathers adopted him. <laughs> You know, they talk, have all this talk about your forefathers when you were in school. I thought everybody had forefathers. <laughs> 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 yeah, but, but, it, but it makes the, the relationships that I have with people now much, mm -hmm. uh, much, much more genuine, I believe. Okay. How about uh, uh, foster parents who uh, take in some kids, but they're doing it because of the money? Is that your situation? Not mine, but I've heard of it. Okay. <laughs> you kind of need you guys to go real, but you, I'm feeling resistance. <laughs> Logan's got it. So my wife works in the foster system. Oh. Okay, yep. There you go. Oh. But I saw you had it over okay. here. You're seven years old, you break a little candy bar, Hershey, into two pieces, and you give your little sister the smallest foot. <laughs> I thought everybody does that. My sister hey, that's does that to wrong? Me all the time. <laughs> She's littler. Littler stomach, littler need. Yeah. So sad. <laughs> that is universal. <laughs> that's relatable. Yeah. <laughs> Logan? It's the story. All right, so I got into a car crash and I had to sell my car. And so I didn't have any way to get around. I was biking to campus for a whole year. And I talked to my jiu-jitsu coach who was trying to sell a car. And I figured I'd trust this guy. He's my coach, blah, blah, blah. Great. He shows me the car, pops the hood, kind of waves his hands a little bit. And he's like, eh, everything's great. I just got it fixed. Uh, I buy the car. And three days later, the radiator is broken. <laughs> And it was just hanging by a, a, a cord. <laughs> do, do you still go to jujitsu? I switched gyms. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
learning from experience. <laughs> okay, what, what should we do now? Okay, so now, we have enough? What we've done is, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, okay. plenty. Right. So um, two things. One, it's kind of interesting that the, the idea automatically does auto-populate these scenarios in which we now have characters that are starting to be hinted at, right? So now we choose one of those, <laughs> one of those scenarios in which we will develop a character and make specific choices about who that person is, uh, we'll develop their belief, we'll decide uh, where the, um, the play takes place, and we'll decide a, a, uh, uh, so we'll make some decisions about the relationship of the other person that's going to be in the play. So those are three things from the beginning. And Lisa, of course, you're welcome to, to massage this beginning, but this is how I would start, as I always, from, from this, an No, this is fine. This is your, this is fine. Okay, from an actor's point of view, uh, so you can't, you can't do a scene until you know the environment, the relationship, uh, and, and the emotional mood or state at the beginning of the scene. You can't start because you don't have enough information. So, we're gonna reverse engineer that and say, which one of these shall we now create our character around? Which of these scenarios? Okay, here's how we're gonna do it this way, time. We're gonna add, 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 uh, do a negative uh, random experiment here. Uh, <laughs> all right, people in this row going back, I'm gonna ask each one of you to say one you don't like and we're gonna cross it off without, and nobody else gets to say, only you, and that's really unfair. <laughs> Life is unfair. Yeah. Well, Bye, Kit and Run. Bye, Kit and Run, okay. Pick one you wanna cross off. Uh, how about Captain in the House? Which one? Captain in the House. Right Captain in the House. House. Okay, bye. Pick one you want to press off. No drug lords. Bye, drug lords. Pick one you want to press off. Okay, pick one you want to press off. Me? Yeah. We're going all the way down the road. Benefactor. Benefactor. Okay. Pick one you want to press off. Foster your parents. Bye. I was going to say that. Um, adoption. Adoption. Okay. Now we're going to do one, two, Talk three, themes. four, five, six. Okay. Now we're going to do uh, audience applause. I'll read them out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We can totally. We can totally applaud too. Because I can't read them. I'm, I'm going to read them off to you All right. right now. Um, I. Um, as a first person, I took somebody's place at a lifeboat and threw them over the side because we haven't figured out the backstory for that person yet. I ate them. Um, the <laughs> detective who sees bad guys rat each other out all the time and therefore believes that people are always out for themselves. Um, the person who hears your mom just keeps saying over and over, people always um, look out for themselves, which perhaps we should tie with the mom who says, we don't have any money for this, <laughs> that you think you want, but I'm just going to go buy everything I want. Um, the, the competitive actions in law school where when you win, someone <coughs> loses. The uh, little sister who only gets the small size of the Hershey bar. <laughs> and the shady jujitsu car salesman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we got those? So, are we applauding only once? We're going to applaud yes. one time. Pick the one you want to applaud for. Got it? Okay. Starting over here. Change to car salesman. <laughs> Little sister with the small Hershey bar. Yeah. Uh, law school. Legs are out. Mom says, you can't have this. We don't have any money. But mom stands for herself. <laughs> It's going to be tough. Um, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. Detective hears bad guys rat each other out. <laughs> um, I, I kick someone out of, out of the lifeboat. <laughs> Can you tell? Yeah. Yeah. Which one? I think, I, well, no, I think we have to just oh. delete the we last. So, yeah, I think we need to run off of like the yeah, uh, two or three of them. We need yeah. To run off. Okay. The, so mom said, yeah. mom says no money is was, was for my money. The, right. the last applause. If you, what would you think the second one was, Michael? I think it's shady jujitsu car sales. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So between these two, mom says, mom says no money. we don't have any money, but she goes out and spends on herself, or. The shady jujitsu car salesman. <laughs> okay. Sounds like a great name of a show. Okay. Okay, we're gonna go, Mom. Okay. 
Shady Jutsu Car Salesman. <laughs> I think Shady sounded louder. Did it? I feel like it was. Can we tie it together? Yeah. How would you do that? What's that? How would you do that? So I guess several encounters of being lied to and and misled by your coach. Well, no. So let's. So for the purposes of this this process, let's pick one of them in here. So you know what? Uh, so, executive producer Adam Leipzig, Leipzig okay. what would you I'm, think I'm is our best gonna, story? I'm, you know, I'm actually going to pick um, the. I'm going to pick mom. Okay, good. I'm going to pick mom right. over here. Excellent. Um, and it may it's well be open. that the shape of Jutsu car salesman shows up in the story. I love it. <laughs> I love it. That's the backstory. Yeah. This is the, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, and remembering that in this, um, the mom is not the is not the person who it's about. Right. It's right. about the child. The daughter. Yes. Who is okay. So this is, this is great be because this is now something that we can create into a one-off play, especially because we now have a college-age student, which is perfect <coughs> as one of the characters at least, and now we just need to get a mom. So, um, so now we have a daughter um, who feels a certain way about her mother because of her mother's actions, right? So let's now, where will this play take place? The first scene that is play. Uh, choose an environment where it takes place. Newport Beach. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Newport Beach is a great city. And can you give me like, so where in Newport Beach? Like in what? Balboa. What's the set going to be? Literally. Is there a bar? <laughs> in a house? In a bar? I'm going to cheer. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So we get in the quiet woman, would be good. In the quiet woman. The bar in Newport Beach would be good. Uh, okay, so it could happen in a bar in Newport Beach. What else? Is that a gym? A gym? That's kind of interesting. Mother daughter working out in a gym? Any, any public place. Okay. <coughs> yeah, uh, so give me a specific public place. I like the quiet woman. She likes the bar in Newport Beach, okay? Because of the pun. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, yes? A shoe store. A shoe store? Oh. 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 Coming out, of the dermatologist shoe store. Office. Coming out of a dermatologist's office where I like the they do other work. Yeah, that's right. Because they do a lot of stuff at dermatology. Beyond dermatology. <laughs> they do a lot more than dermatology. That's yeah. right. So it's dermatologist slash yeah, plastic surgeon. Okay. Um, okay, so that's great. Um, and this is a play? We're doing yeah, this, this is, yeah. a theater piece, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this could be a 10 minute play. It could be a half hour play. We'll just see what we get today. Okay, well, you want to okay, make a comment? I do. I'd I like to say, Go. before you do that, though, I mean, don't you think it's a good idea when you say, you know, okay, the mom says, you can't have that, I'm spending the money on myself. I would really like to know, like, what socioeconomic group are we talking about here? Right. Are they poor and mom is, like, taking the money for herself so she could go out and go to the bar and meet some guy? Mm -hmm. Or are they really wealthy and it's a power thing? Like, like what is, because I think that would, you know, help you figure the other out more, or yeah. else it's generic. Sure. No, so that would be my question: is you know, okay, who Need are the these people a little bit more, um, so that we get where they, you know, would actually be? I don't think they're wealthy. I think they're, 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 they're yeah. middle class. Kind of thing. Okay. Middle class. All right. So, yeah. I think she's recently divorced, and she wants to get remarried, and so she's spending money on herself. Okay. So okay. You know, that's, that's good. The money that she got to support her kids' schooling, she's using some of that. Uh -huh. Aha. Okay. Or, or, just, just to say an or, so that nobody's just a hundred percent bad. Or, <laughs> she got the money and it should have gone to her daughter. Yes. But she has nothing and thinks, and because she's wrong about this, because people are often wrong too, but she thinks the only way I'm going to be able to get money for my daughter is if I get married again, and the only way I'm going to get some guy to like me is if I've got these fancy clothes and go to the quiet woman and meet some guy. Therefore, even though I want her to have this, I know I need to do that, so that she's not just being a jerk to the daughter. Because if she's just a jerk, then it's, you know, unless you have some deep reason as to why, then it's less interesting. Just a thought. Okay. Just so, a thought. Not that it has yeah. to be that. Well, she's but justifying it. There's that. rationality to it. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. And to go ahead and riff on that, I like yeah. that a lot, especially because the dynamic is somebody who is lower on the socioeconomic uh, level or ladder 
than the people they are socializing with, and then yeah. need to okay. uh, cover up any mm -hmm. internal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. raging mess. Yes, yes. Yeah. exactly. Very good. <clears throat> okay, so I like that we're riffing off of this one now sort of central theme, and now, mm -hmm. in my mind, I say we just accept it for the sake of time, and move <laughs> forward with this idea cool. that this character yeah. is, what, what did we decide on, Lisa? What do you think works best? And then, Adam, you'll prove it. Go. I mean, I think what works best is that they don't have that much money, that she's been left, that they've got the money uh, a little bit. There is a bit of selfishness, too, because she wants another guy, but she feels like that's the only way I'm going to be able to support my daughter anyway. Uh, what, did so she leave or did he leave? Is she a climber? No, no, because I think I just think we want to stay away from the misogynistic tropes of you know, oh, women are clear. They're just you know now she's so that's why I'm trying to like soften the other just a little bit, so you don't fall because it's so easy to fall into the especially with women. I find this with writers all the time. They fall into the misogynistic tropes. Oh, she's a gold digger. Oh, mom's clinging. Oh, mom's mom's always always the bad guy because the guy never is even there. He's like left. So that's so I'm just trying to say. That me, because it also gives them something so it's, it's always great where somebody seems awful you took that and that belonged to me and it's like but no honey I did it because I'm really trying to get this for you and that's why you know and that's why I did it so I would and Adam you can totally like okay. knock all that I, down I, let's go or there. turn let's that go into that. something let's go. so now that's where we I have go. two characters we already have sort of a point yeah. of view which is kind of funny but now I actually want to cement that point of view by creating the memories for each one of this character that made them make the decision that people only look out for themselves. So we'll do one at a time. I'll take about a minute apiece. Um, so first, let's think about the mom's <coughs> perception. Right. How did the mom decide? What happened in the mom's path? Well, first of all, I'm sorry. Uh, which one is the main character? The, the daughter? The daughter. Well, I, I, okay. I, and when you, it was your story, so it seems like it would be the daughter. Yeah, no, well, it's like the that. daughter the main yeah. character. Yeah. yeah, and then we need to have um, different points of view. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the mother, what is the mother's belief about people only look out for themselves? Does she believe it or does she not believe it? And just make a statement about what her belief is. Well, she might believe it precisely because her husband Okay, so she staunchly believes that people look out for themselves because her husband left her is maybe part of that reason. Exactly, good. Okay? Other people, but not herself. She, she Other people. Believes. Right. She believes that she... Right. That no, she, that's exactly right. That's perfect. Yes, yeah. her belief is that... That's, no, that's perfect. Her belief is that other people look out for themselves. What, what we're going to find out in the course of the story is maybe she... So her, so her belief is that people only look out for themselves, correct? Or people should look out for themselves because she didn't do that before and that went wrong, so now she Oh, should. so she learned our lesson. lesson. Okay, yeah. all right. So let's go with that. Now, what about the daughter? What is the daughter's perspective on people uh, only look out for themselves? Well, dad left, right? So she's going to think <clears throat> he was looking out for himself. So her belief is also that people only look out for themselves? What about with her mom? Her, statement, now her right? mom's spending all her mom. money on herself. Right. So. Jo, I just want to know the belief. What is her statement, right? So I she. Think, I think the daughter believes if my mother loves me, she'll give me what I need. Okay. Well, and I think with that you'd come out too, and you try to figure out why does she need whatever she needs at that moment in these clothes, or whatever does she want. So it isn't just I want a fancy pair of blah blah blah. Will you get me that? Right. Yeah. What's at stake for her there? I, I That the I like father that. is left with the daughter. I don't know. There's something about it that just feels. I, I'm very much in favor of not going to uh, the setups that everybody saw last night on CSI. It's, I, it's, I, I think that we too easily get to what we think stories should be instead of something far more interesting like life. 
Okay, well, I, I'm okay with that. The point is just to make the decision and then get in the character's shoes. So um, do we want to move forward with a same-sex um, couple that... That's that, what we have to do. Yeah, yeah. You know, I sort of go, what's new? Yeah, I, I don't know. Raise your hand if you think well, the same sex I don't comes to ask a question. I, yeah. Because most of your beliefs are going to be rooted in your child. Right. Mm -hmm. so, Correct. So, Correct. So, you know, we're talking about the child is the deal, but, it, you know, most of what she's going to be seeing is a reflective of whatever her parents had belief, you know, whatever beliefs were instilled exactly. from, their, from their perspective and mm -hmm. their situation. So... Again, we have, if it's the lower socioeconomic uh, characteristic, that, that, well, that's what happened before, right? That's what right, that's mom a, that's and dad saw of, before that's the past they got there. Right. So this is a long line of people mm -hmm. saying what goes on. Yeah, no, for sure. Okay, so let's create those past experiences, right? That's, that'll be the next step. So, uh, so go ahead. Close your eyes or open them, I don't care. <laughs> what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to create the moment when the daughter made the decision that people only look out for themselves. Think about, this is your own sort of memory of what, what happened, okay? Now what I, what I want you to do now is as you think about that event that occurred to this person that you're going to experience, float above the scene. So from a disassociated perspective is what we call it. float above the scene, looking down on the scene. The first thing I'd like you to do is visually create the environment where this event takes place. So go ahead and put the furniture if it's indoors or the uh, trees if it's outdoors. But go ahead and visually arrange the, event, the space where this event takes place. So it's only one event, isn't it? A series of no, things? No, well right now we're going to do one. Moment. We're going to do one. Okay. There's going to be a moment actually is correct. Yeah. So create the space. See where things are. Notice the distance between things in that space. Now, go ahead and notice what sounds you might expect to hear in that environment. Notice the sounds that will be in the immediate environment, and then notice the sounds that will be in the peripheral of that environment as well, what sounds might be there. Now, go ahead and look at the, the physiological position, the posture of the people in that scene, the girl who you're going to embody in a minute. How is she holding herself at this moment when she makes that decision? And if there are other people in that scene, put them also in their physiological position, <coughs> their posture. And notice what that tells you. And now, when you're ready, go ahead and float down into the girl's body, looking through the girl's eyes. And go ahead and notice the environment. And now, through that first person perspective, go ahead and notice where things are at this time. Notice the distance to places. Notice colors, textures, whatever you notice visually. Hear the sounds in this environment, in this moment. Feel what it feels like. Imagine yourself in that physiological position. Imagine yourself embodying the posture of this character in this moment. And then notice what you might say to yourself as the character in this moment. When you make the decision that people only look out for themselves. And lastly, what is the one thing that you notice in this moment when you make that decision? Is it something you see, something you hear, something you feel, or something you say to yourself when you make that decision that people only look out for themselves? And then when you're ready, come back to now. Okay, take a deep breath. Everybody spill popcorn? <laughs> No, let's just be me. Okay, second character. <laughs> second character. What happens in the mom's life now that makes her make the decision? What moment does she make the decision that people only look out for themselves? We're going to do the same thing, so I'll go a little faster. From a disassociative view, go ahead and float above the scene. Notice the environment or the space where this, this event occurs. Go ahead and create it for yourself visually. The more details you can use, the better. Pay particular attention about the distance between things in this space, whether it's indoors or outdoors. Notice what sounds you might hear. And notice the physiological posture of the character, the mom, when she makes this decision. And then when you're ready, now, go ahead and float down into the character's body, looking through the character's eyes, noticing what you see 
as you look around that space. Again, noticing the distance between yourself and objects that you've placed in this space. Really hear the sounds in the environment. Go ahead and notice what it feels like to be in the body, especially holding yourself in that physiological position that your character is in in that moment. Notice if you have a certain sensation at some point in your body as you hold yourself in this way and notice what she's noticing in the moment. And then ask yourself, what might you say to yourself in that moment? When you make that decision. And then lastly, what is the one thing that you notice when you make the decision that people only look out for themselves? Is it something you see, hear, feel, or say to yourself? And then when you're ready, Come back to now. Okay, and now hopefully, you now have a personalized experience of that character as they made that decision and have a better understanding of why they believe what they believe. And as writers, we do an interesting thing because you need to go back and forth from being sort of a, a godlike figure where you're looking at the, all the characters and then actually embodying one particular character and how they feel in order to create their actions. So now, at this point, we're going to do, we're just going to choose the first incident tonight for this purpose of time. And Lisa, I'd like for you to help us guide through what the first event would be. We know that we are, we decided we're in the bar, right? No. Oh, where, where did we decide we are? We didn't decide. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's. We, 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 we didn't decide. That's why I was. We, 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 we didn't decide, and and you know, yeah. we had an early discussion when we were pre-discussing, and you sort of said, Adam, you make these decisions, and I yeah. said, politically, I kind of hate that. Yeah, right. But I'm gonna I'm gonna to say this is my, uh, this is my lifeline. This is the moment I'm gonna make a decision. Good. And I'm gonna, yes. I'm, gonna I'm gonna throw you all off. I have a big, big predilection for the shoe store. Okay. Yeah. And I have because right. because I don't think I think it could be funny. Mm -hmm. Yes. I like funny. There's a lot of business the actors can do with the shoes and the boxes and the stuff. I think it's more fun. There's a lot of plays that are set in bars. Shoe store sounds more interesting to me. I, so I I'm it. saying shoe store. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent okay. executive position. So now, Lisa, how would you coach our writing team? Now that they have some understanding of this character's past experience, and we know that this, well, how would you coach them in choosing the event that would start off this story in the shoe store between the mother and the daughter? I would have to know, I yeah. personally, yeah. I would have to, to know more before I could do that. Because yeah. those, what they were feeling to me was a lot of what, and I didn't hear any why. So I would need to know, okay, if they're in the shoe store, and, and, just, and, and just, again, and for all of this is always to get the first layer down, because stories come in layers. So this is the first layer, and then you can ask why. And the goal in everything is always to dig it down to the, to the final why, and the why isn't something that you can answer with a single declarative sentence, but it's something that comes in, often in, in, in scene form. Even if you're writing screenplays or plays, you're still writing it out in scene form, meaning in terms of, of novelistically. So basically what I would need to know, there's why are they in that shoe store? If, if this is gonna be about the fact that the mom has this money and is not spending it on the daughter, and the daughter has a reason why she needs something, I would need to know what that situation was. That, because that's why they're there. Like what, you know, what does it mean to the daughter? Why is this that moment where, where this is gonna come to loggerheads? So why does she need, if it's about shoes, which one of them needs the shoes? Why does she need the shoes? What if they run into each other at the shoe store? Yeah! <laughs> That's, and the and the mother has what said, if Jimmy but you Chu, South right. Coast Plaza, right. daughter is wandering right. by and sees mom in right. there. Yes, right yeah, caught red-handed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That you, you literally go. played the moment right. that I had right. in my head. But, <laughs> but, yeah, thank you. So, but even so, wait, just the last thing. But even yeah. so, you still <coughs> need to know because this is what would come up for mm -hmm. the daughter because they're not really arguing over shoes or even money. They're arguing over why aren't you there for me. So you need to know why it matters to the daughter at that moment, as opposed to, well, because this always the happens, or because you've said it. The girl's on a sports team, and she needs equipment to go to the sports camp because she thinks she's so good at it, she might even get a college scholarship. Oh. And hmm. it's very important for her to be able to participate in that. 
And mom has no money. And mom doesn't have wealth. Mom it's might have some money. Right. We'll give her right. right. Mom has said no. Yeah, because, the, because something like that, whether that works or not, I don't know if that seems to. But at least that gives that reason as to not only is she doing it that way because she wants to, but because there is nothing else. The only way she can do it, and the only thing she needs in order to, to do this thing for herself is this one thing that she's got to get from her mother who says, but Maybe mom you know, doesn't think no. she's good enough to actually be good at the sports camp. And she's trying to save her from the horror right. of finding oh, out that you don't. And Excellent. of spending the money because she wants the damn shoes. Right. So, <laughs> so you've got that. But too. she rationalizes that. She justifies yes. why right. she wouldn't yes. get the shoes. Yeah. Go ahead. So, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going just, to, just to throw out so we don't get too literal, uh, what if it's, uh, and, and like this is not to, do, not to do, but just so we're not so literal, what if it's 20 years later and the daughter goes in to buy shoes and the mom is there selling the shoes? <laughs> oh, twist. <laughs> that, that could be a great, that could be, a, that, that could be a second scene, right? And, and, you, don't, and you don't find out that they're mother and daughter until... 15 minutes into the flight. I don't know. Right. I'm just like there's a lot there's there's a lot of non non-linear ways mm -hmm. to think about playing and revealing. No, just, for sure. Just tossing that up. No, no, I love it. I love it. So listen, we are we are at our events uh, time limit, so certainly if anybody has to leave, you go right ahead and thank you so much for joining us. I think what I'll do though is No, 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 no. We're gonna keep going for a little while. No, are we gonna go for a little more? I don't know. We're here as long as okay, you guys are here. Okay, so we're we're having fun. We to get yeah. two events, let's, 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 and then I, I also want to yeah, get people extra innings, exactly. extra innings. option for questions. But the start. If, you, if you gotta go, you gotta go. Perfectly fine. That's, having said that, okay. But let me ask you guys a question, because yeah. this is a question, as, as the, the, ner the one who knows the yeah. least yes. about story, my question is this, because Adam brings up an excellent point. How do you feel about stories that sort of transcend time that way? So let's say you do have a, a scene or some actions that are early in life and then you jump 20 years later and then you have some other some other episode how does one create that bridge right how do you I mean that seems like a very in, in, a, in, a, in a movie it's really easy to say okay yeah. cut scene go to the next one and now they're 20 years later you can make them all look older and so on but how do we bridge that narrative how do we create the intervening pieces Right. I mean, I, I, what I think is you have to know what happened in between stories specifically, and then that's related in both who they are at that moment and what they say to each other. Right. But you have to know what it is. It's not like they go into stasis for, you know, from, right. from like 20 to 40, and now suddenly there they are. You have to know what that is in as much detail as the other, because that's that prior experience. But right. now it's really cool, because we already know the beginning, and this is how it's been tempered, and now maybe it's flipped. I think that's a great idea that then it, it either starts later or are you saying that that's the second scene? No, I, I, think, the, I think it yeah. starts later. It starts I would never yeah. really want yeah. to see them. I never. I personally would yeah. never want to see mom and daughter in the primal scene of the kitchen table. I'd want right. that to be 20 years of a right. backstory. Right. And, the answer, and, and to answer your question, that's really how theater works, right? Like you, you look at, you know, long days journey into tonight. We don't see the whole history of that family uh, O'Neill drops clues so we understand how they got to that place. Mm -hmm. But we put we we construct the backstory. Right, there's a lot of inference by, that we have by to, watching. Able to do watching. Well, and that's skillful writing. Right. Yeah. And the way you achieve that is by what Lisa's saying now and what you're alluding to as well. Is you've got to create the events that happen when she was saying you have to create she's talking about the writer. The yeah. writer has to know. The characters don't know, right? And the audience learns over time. But the writer has all that information at the very beginning, which is the whole premise of what her, she's teaching and what we're working towards here. And each character knows. I mean, they know what their own past is, and they know yeah, what, yeah. yeah. But right. the others don't, sure. Yeah. So, okay, so let's, let's nail down an event then. We're, are we, are we, we're starting in the shoe store? Yeah, it's a yeah. one, uh, well, it's a one set play. Uh, that's right. I know. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> and we're starting with the event where they accidentally run into each other, right? So then, working towards the next event, to, to use sort of your method, Lisa, and I know you said you yeah, definitely yeah, know more yeah, about yeah, what yeah. happened. Um, what, 
we, what we choose is what happens, right, and then the consequence of what happens. So this is now the cause and effect aspect of our brains, the way that we narratively understand the world, right? So um, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, I like the idea of like starting 20 years later and then maybe this is the way that like she reconciles this misbelief, like people only look out for themselves. Like when she sees her mom there like working in the shoe store, it's like a moment of like reconciliation. She like empathizes with her and she understands like her childhood. She wasn't just living for herself, spending this money. She was actually trying her best for her. So maybe that's how so, we so in that case, that the people looking out for themselves that. truly becomes a misbelief, right? That's that's yeah, something I mean, that, that gets resolved that was at the end of the story. Right. And that yeah. would be the, that would be the final scene, then, right, Lisa? Right. Of course. Yeah, yeah. That would be the resolving of the right. misbelief. I mean, okay. Sure. So then, so then, in that case, the question is, <laughs> now, <laughs> what happens between right. the beginning where she sees her mom? And the end, where we fast forward to 20 years later, and she realizes that, oh, you know, my misbelief was a misbelief, and now I see it. Yes? I'm so confused, because we started out with the point, which is supposed to be the message. What was the message? Right, and that's the thing. And we're treating it as if it was the misbelief. That's right. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. Because it be, the misbelief becomes right. about You're right. the story. Right. Yeah, but it becomes yeah. about the story point, right? But then where's right. the change? If the, if the story is the, inner if the, the interchange of the character. If her misbelief is, because it wasn't really the point, and you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. you're, I pointed out that's exactly true. The way that this was, is that people only look out for themselves would have been her misbelief. And what would happen here is that, no, people actually look out for each other as well. You still got to look out for yourself, but people look out for each other as well. And that's what she would, would come to. And that's a, I'm glad you said that, because you're exactly right there. So you get a positive consequence at the end, right? Is that the yeah, so belief in human nature realize, is actually good. Right. Or, I mean, whether she realizes it, right? I mean, it's not, it's not like you have to tie it up in a neat bow in any way, shape, or form. She can even realize her mother was still awful, but that some people actually do come through with each other, or even understanding the why behind it. So then you if know, we just depending. hold this back and say, OK, well, that is the misbelief, but what, was, what is the point of the story then? Yeah, that would be the question. Is the point that that people people do care about each other? Maybe the point is we don't always see how people care about. It. Yeah, sometimes it looks like something that they really do care. Yeah, that's and that's a really we don't always know. Yeah, and that's a great point. We might think if it looks like this, it may not be. Right. Right. So we've got to figure out a better phrase. Exactly. Exactly. So so we do have a story arc now. We have an opening, and we know where we're going. So should we just try to add one event in the middle where we bridge from here to there? And then this will uh, be I have a suggestion, but I want to hear what other people have to say. Okay, yeah. sure. Uh, I'm actually going to backtrack just a moment because okay. I almost kind of want to flip it. I feel like mom's the protagonist. And her comeuppance in the world is that she ends up working at a shoe store. Mm -hmm. I would actually, uh, mm -hmm. that's her realization is that, wow, whether I was or wasn't looking out for my for myself, that's how it was perceived, and that has it led to me having like no relation with my children and poss my child and possibly grandchildren, mm. except selling her shoes mm. when she comes in because she has a wealthy husband who pays for everything she wants. Mm. She says, oh my God, what did I do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no reason actually the secondary character can't also have an awakening. Oh, yeah, a, often uh, they do in, in a two-character play. I would yeah, think. Yeah, right. So have, I mean, if they both, both do, that's great too. Mark. And what about yeah. the intervening event being the daughter having her own child? Okay. I mean, we're talking 20 years later, right? Right, like in five years. So being a mother years. herself and, and feeling that... That changes a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but see, <laughs> but the, and the other thing you'd want to figure out talking about that, if yeah. you are going to start back then and then come to now, is, well, what's her relationship with her mom? Like, do they have no relationship? Like, thinking of that opening before the book Glass Castle, you know, where she's going down, if you've read that memoir, Glass Castle, where she's going and she sees her mother diving in the dumpster. You know, she's going to this fancy party and there's her mom diving in the dumpster and she pulls her out and says, no, I can help you. And her mom's like, yeah, no, I want to go back to the dumpster. <laughs> I'm happier there. But I mean, so the question would be, what was their relationship? If she sees her mom and she's working in the shoe store, it sounds like she didn't know her mom worked in that shoe store. So that would have been a shock. So are they, you know, have they been estranged for that amount of time? Yeah. Maybe. What if the mom abandoned the daughter when she's really young 
and then later the mom was working at the store and the daughter tracked her down to being at the store and she goes to buy shoes but the mom no longer recognizes the daughter but the daughter knows it's her and then she's like going to purchase purchase the shoes to see if the to see if the mom would remember the daughter and the daughter's like kind of testing the mom and like that's how she's like kind of revealing herself again well, I kind of like that. Here we go. We get I like that. A recognition scene. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, is, do, do you think it should be abandonment, uh, or do you think it was maybe the daughter's realization that the mother maybe was out for herself, or that was her perception, and she ran away? Yeah, she ran I away think from home. The perception yeah. is that the daughter, when she was abandoned, thought the mom only had her self interest in mind, and that's why she gave the daughter up. And then maybe there's, hmm. and that's what she's confronting. But then maybe something different happened. It's just the daughter's perception. I think for the story uh, with the abandonment story, I think it should be at an age of like seven or ten, where mm -hmm. the child can really recognize that she has been left alone. Mm -hmm. Right. That she cared for. I like the mom not knowing that. Like yeah. the daughter comes and the mom mm -hmm. has yeah, I think that's just like working the job. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's really a nice good. Reveal, right. right, Adam? Or right. Yeah. Reveals are good. Yeah. yeah. Reveals are good, yeah. Yeah. And, and then the question is, though, did she recognize her and not say something in that moment where she wasn't sure? And then it comes out like, no, when you first came in, I had a feeling of. So you could play with I mean, in other words, there's a lot. She you might have a recognizable her, feature really or a cool. saying or something that reminds her of her childhood, something that only her daughter would know, oh. and then that would be the reveal. Yeah. If she hears her say it, then you know, that would be the clue. Uh, yeah. I could do this. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that hard, guys. Come on. <laughs> I think if there's some kind of estrangement that comes about where that I think that opens up the door for the want for the mother. If if the daughter is estranged, the mother can want to try and reopen that relationship. And if there's a grandchild, that grandchild can stand as the mother want or the yeah the mother wanting to connect with her grandchild and be able to um, talk with her. So if maybe the the daughter comes in and the, the mother recognizes her daughter, but her daughter daughter doesn't recognize her mother or something. Maybe that opens the, the one for the um, uh, the mother trying to like find some way to get back in this relationship somehow. I don't know. Or maybe, I mean, it's, it's possible or it's, it's possible also that she recognizes that at that point it's too late. Right, it's very much too late to get back into her daughter's life, and she reconciles with the possibility that, hey, maybe I spent my life thinking about the wrong things, prioritizing the wrong things, and didn't focus on this relationship. And it doesn't have to be a happy ending, right? Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe like um, the daughter, like just because of the way her mom acted and made her feel like people were looking for themselves. Like when she turned 18 or whatever, she just like never talked to her family again. And then so both of them, like at this point, they feel like they should reconnect, but they don't know. Huh? All okay, right. So what's next, David? So, well, I think at this juncture, we have a beginning and we have an end. And I think we call that, that that'll be the mm -hmm. spine of our play. That will yeah. now have our writing team develop this idea. The play begins in the uh, shoe store when the mother, uh, the daughter comes upon the mother buying selfishly shoes. And then we will now, outside of this venue, have writers work on the events that lead to the 20 year reunion when the daughter comes back and has her aha moment. Right? I like this. I mean, we could keep going if we had another few. No, no, hours, this is good. But we don't. We got to quit while you're ahead. But I, yeah, but I think we've. Yes, sir. We don't. I don't feel like it's powerful enough. Like, you could do something more powerful than just the daughter seeing the mom buy like, more expensive shoes. It's probably like a better, more dramatic way to. Daughter murdering the shoe clerk. So we've we've come up with a we've come up. Well, it, you would remember. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll find out. The, the, the intervening yeah. events could certainly build up that drama. Okay. And yeah. Okay. So I think at this point, I you know I, I don't know what we do. I, I planned on if anybody had questions. I mean, we could open up for questions, but I think in well, we terms also of have, brainstorming. Yeah, and, and we're happy to, so I, I recognize that it's kind of past the time, so we have refreshments outside, and we're going to hang out for a bit. If you guys have questions and you want to chat about some of these topics, we'll, we'll stick around for a little bit, right? It's, uh, at some point, I'm sure these guys want to go home. I'm the only one who's homeless and doesn't need to go home. <laughs> I'm kidding. They will be here till midnight, yeah. and, and we'll, we'll be happy to take questions. But we're going to, at some point, also announce the next event in which you will be able to see this performance and critique it and reflect on it and talk about 
how we've been able to, to, to do this and, and come full circle. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Along those lines, so for those of us who did the registration for, through Eventbrite, can we expect an email from you telling us when the next? Yes. Yes. All of you who have registered <laughs> online, you will get, and you won't have to do it through Eventbrite anymore. We'll use because Eventbrite was not a good call for this. We're gonna we're gonna use our own system next time, and we'll make sure that everybody gets information about where the event's gonna be. Uh, it might have to move out of this room, so we have an actual performance area as well. Uh, but we'll we'll yeah. coordinate that, and we'll get back to you. It'll be after the new year for sure, because we want to give the writers and the the uh, the actors time to conceive of this fully. Yeah. So the only thing we need is a name for the play. <laughs> we'll let the writer work on that. I was going to say. Yeah. So I'd like to thank you all for coming and congratulate you for creating the first ever neuroscientist and designed one-act play. Nice job, writers. Thank you. You guys did a great job.